Thank you, Alan, and thank you very much for the opportunity to come. I hope some of this information is useful to you in facing some of your challenges. Um, what I would do is just take you very briefly through our policy context, talk about the millennium drought, because it was the prospect of things to come for us. Look at some of the key policy responses in terms of our water allocation frameworks, our urban, rural and environmental responses. And then a cautionary note, what happened when the drought broke. Right, in Australia we have had a history of water reform, 20 years virtually, and a lot of that water reform has been focused on really trying to make sure we have clear, unambiguous property rights to water held by the environment, held by urban authorities for their communities, and held by rural authorities which translate into property rights for irrigators. So clear property rights. As a precursor, actually providing certainty to all those users, but then as a precursor to the operation of a water market, which has been the way that we have transferred waters from high value use, uh, sorry, low value use to high value use without the intervention of government. And a lot of what we've done over 20 years is actually focus on water efficiency. From our rural sectors, we want high value, high performing, sustainable irrigation. From our urban sectors, we want urban authorities providing their communities with a reliability of supply and contributing to the livability of those communities. And there's been a lot of effort in improvement of environment, of rivers and streams. And it's not just providing environmental water, although that, that is critical. It's setting it in the context of catchment management and improving river health. And it's on the assumption that this underpins, a healthy environment will underpin our regional economies and their regional well-being. So we've been doing it for 20 years and then the millennium drought struck. Now it struck southeastern Australia um, down here. The states of Victoria and New South Wales, a bit of Queensland and South Australia. It also struck Tasmania but we're not talking about them much. And they share the Murray-Darling Basin. That is a really significant area in Australia, the food bowl of Australia. And you can see it's the worst drought on record. And the reforms I'll talk about are predominantly in Victoria, a lot in the Murray-Darling, but the directions that we worked in were worked in in all of those states. Now the drought itself started in 97, although some would say maybe earlier, and it went through to 2009. And on any of the hydrologic indices that hydrologists care to use, it was the longest, the deepest, and the most severe on record. And it was really important for us to grapple with this because all of our climate change predictions for this area of Australia are that we will have reduced inflows. And our worst case climate change prediction was a reduction of 44% of inflows by 2050. And I will show you <laughs> that we were actually living through conditions much worse than that. So people were highly engaged around the drought and they were willing to accept that this was their future. Therefore, what we put in place was almost climate adaptation. Now, these are the monthly inflows for the Murray River in the Murray-Darling Basin. The blue up the top here is the long-term average. It's sort of, you know, we have a lot of inflows in our spring, in our summer, not that much. The black line is 0607. It was the lowest inflow year on record and it smashed the record. Effectively, it was the lowest by a third. 07, 08, the red line would have been the lowest on record, except we had 06, 07. So we were starting to have years in sequences that actually were making us question how useful our historical record for planning was going to be. And the importance of this is talking about our entitlements and allocation against them. In this area, we have low reliability entitlements. They didn't get any water through the drought and we have high reliability entitlements. In 06, 07, those high reliability entitlements started the season with a declaration of 76% of allocation, finished it at 95. First year that these suite of entitlements had never had 100%. But the effect of that 06, 07 year, the next year, those high reliability entitlements started with zero and they finished the season with 43%. Now that's an important thing because that starts to flavour a lot of what we did. So what were the impacts? In terms of urban, 
all of the major centres, Brisbane, Sydney, Melbourne, Adelaide, all on restrictions, all restricted to indoor residential use only. All of our urban cities around the country, stage four restrictions, indoor use only. We were carting water to many small rural communities for years, which is very expensive. In terms of irrigation, the high reliability entitlements were starting the years at somewhere between zero and 10%, and there was no water against the low. The annual crops of rice and cotton, there was none, or very, very little during that period. The perennial crops of vines and orchards, which use a high reliability product, after that 06, 07 year, people were sacrificing a third of those. And so it was pretty terrible. <laughs> there were mental health impacts, there were huge job losses, we had foreclosures, um, farm suicide rate increased significantly. Um, and we could even detect the impact at the national economic level. From the environment, it was pretty bad too. For the whole period of, of the 12 years of the drought, we had reduced stream flows. In Western Victoria, those stream flows were reduced for that period by 80 to 90%. And in regulated rivers, rivers with dams on them, all of the passing flows, which are for the environment and protected by law, were qualified and reduced to provide water for critical human needs. I think that's curtailment in, in your situation. I think that's the equivalent. And as a result, we were seeing really significant environmental impacts. 70% 70 70 of river red gums along the Murray system were dead or dying. Water birds in the southeast Australia down to third their numbers. We had some species at risk of extinction and we had the lower lakes at the whole end of the Murray-Darling system in South Australia starting to turn acid. So what did we do? Well, we built on the policy, you know, reforms that we had made and everything we did, we looked at balancing economic, social and environmental issues. We looked at significantly looking at the environmental, social and economic implications of every decision. They were integrated decisions. And the principles that we took were, well, everything we do must work under a drier climate. That's what we're looking towards. We're not just trying to get through this drought, we're preparing now for a different um, management regime. Clearly improve efficiency. The water that we have should be as efficiently used as possible across all those sectors. Entitlement holders, regardless of who they are, need to be managed, able to manage their own climate risk. We needed to give them tools to do that and allow them to do it and get out of their way. And part of that is facilitating the operation of the water market. And finally, when there was government investment in this, we looked for multi-benefit solutions. Solutions which may perhaps modernise irrigation, save water for the environment. And I have to mention the Murray-Darling Basin Plan because I'm sure a number of you have heard of it. It was at this point that the federal government announced a $13 billion initiative to rebalance the Murray-Darling, given it was over-allocated. And what that does is to set up a new sustainable diversion limit and to acquire the water from the consumptive pool to the environmental pool. But it's a 12 to 15 year project. And so it actually, um, it will, goes alongside the reforms I'm talking about. Now the water market is critical. That year 0708, which I mentioned had the lowest allocations, had the highest level of trading of those allocations. 45% of that water was actually traded. Critical to getting through the drought. Now, for a water market to operate, it needs to have water. Zero allocation years are not a good thing. It needs to have water at the time people are making decisions, which is around September. And we need to be able to guarantee that when people have bought water on the market, they can get it to their properties. So some of the reforms in the market that we worked on was to actually assist the market to operate under extreme conditions and to help individuals. We introduced carryover. So an individual entitlement holder could decide to use their water, their allocation, they could sell it, or they could carry over some in the storages till next season. Really important for irrigators and really important for the environment. We changed the system reserve, reserve rules, whereby we kept a little bit more back before we started declaring allocations. That reduced the potential probability of zero allocation years for high reliability water, and it provided some certainty that our systems could deliver it. If you carried it over, if you bought water on the market, you would be able to get it. 
And we looked for clearer environmental entitlements, which gave the environment credit for return flows. So if you're an irrigator, you draw the water off and you water your property, our expectation is you're as efficient as you can and in an ideal situation, there's no drainage returns. But for the environment, you want to water a wetland, you put it on the wetland, 70 to 80% of that water will flow back to the river. So we put in place the conditions whereby the environment can actually claim some of that back and utilise it further downstream, become a very efficient use. And we improve the water grid physically to extend the coverage of the market. In the urban systems, the goal was for the long term that they should be able to supply their communities with a minimum supply of water where they didn't put them on restrictions too often and they didn't ask for qualification of rights and plunder the environment too often. So where they went was demand management, really aggressively. And over the period of the drought in Melbourne, water utilisation per capita dropped by 43%. And even though the drought has broken, in 11-12, it still remains at about that level. So we had a per capita usage, residential use in Melbourne in 11-12 of 149 litres per person per day, which is about 39 gallons per person per day. They looked at alternative sources, groundwater, recycled water, stormwater, where they could. Some actually went and bought permanent entitlement on the market and diversified their sources. But then we actually had to move and augment. And so we found ourselves augmenting in nearly all the major cities. And they were not dams. They were desal plants. I must tell you, they were highly, highly controversial. But they all have a desal plant right this minute and we extended the water grid interconnected. So the water grid in Victoria now has pipes that, in this one over here, again, highly controversial, but joins the Murray-Darling system to the Melbourne system. This one over here joins the whole southeast Victoria into the Murray-Darling. Now, what this means is water can travel physically down a pipe, but it also means water by substitution can move back. So theoretically, we could have water from the desal plant in Melbourne move and be used in the Murray system. We haven't, because it's highly controversial, but it is enabled to occur. In agriculture, the major shifts that we made were those entitlement reforms that I mentioned earlier, enabling irrigators to manage their own risks and make their own decisions. But there was also significant investment, some of it from the Murray-Darling Basin Plan, in irrigation modernisation and irrigation efficiency. And so we're modernising all of Northern Victoria's irrigation network, $2 billion, and it will save 430 gigalitres of water for the environment. It will provide a higher level of service to irrigators, and it will be very, very efficient. And that was actually combined with investment into whole farm planning and on-farm efficiencies as well. And it worked. From a revenue perspective, if you like, in 0809, our farms were using, our irrigators used 53% of the water they used in 0506, which was still in the drought. But the on-farm production was only 21% reduction. So effectively, through the drought, our irrigators actually ended up using virtually a third of their water and getting two thirds of their production. And what we've found is our irrigation industries have taken that as their aspiration. They want to get to the point where they get twice the production from half the water. Now, from the environmental perspective, we also had to rethink. We really had to rethink. How do we want to manage the environment during drought? Basically, some of our environmental flow studies would say to us, oh, well, shove a flush down a river. But the river was a series of pools, the community would have slit your throat and you didn't actually have enough water for a flush, so what did you do? Well, we went back to first principles and looked at what does the environment do naturally in drought in Australia? And it contracts. It contracts to drought refuges and a range of places which sustain biodiversity and if the resilience is there, it will recover during wetter years. And that's the paradigm that we brought to this. What did we do during extreme drought? We ensured the high value environmental assets survived and we would provide the wherewithal that they could recover during wetter periods. So that then flowed through. It flowed through how we used environmental water during the drought, the little bit that we had. It flowed through into, well, how much water does the environment need and what does it need? Well, it needs high reliability water for drought 
and it needs lower reliability in the wetter years and we can start to actually work out exactly what the portfolio should look like. And so we really then moved into, well, what do we need to know? Planning and knowledge. Well, clearly we need to know where our drought refuges are and where are the key aspects of resilience. And so it changed a range of our planning as well. And so in that year of 0708 that we've talked about already, we watered, we used the environmental entitlements, had 43% allocation like the irrigators did. And we used that water to actually save a species from extinction prevent some cat catastrophic black water events, catastrophic algal bloom events, and we watered drought refuges. And sometimes we used, sometimes we used consumptive water en route. So here we used environmental entitlement and we pumped it with irrigation pumps to save some red gums. And where we put water into wetlands using pumps, sometimes we made an irrigation channel run backwards. We actually got results. We got breeding in some areas of endangered species. It was great. So in summary, what we tried to do every reform was really looking at the environmental, social and economic implications all at once. And it was critical that we did that. We were under a lot of scrutiny. We worked on the principle this is the future, not just that we have to get through it. It was efficiency in all sectors. The grid at the highest level allows you to move the water around. In the urban, it was household and industry becoming much more efficient. In the rural, it's the on-farm and the irrigation systems, and it's the environment, it's using works, smart river operations, consumptive water on you, a whole range of ways that we can actually get water to places. We gave entitlement holders the tools to manage their own risk, and we tried to make the water market able to operate even in extreme circumstances and we supplied augmentation. And the environmental paradigm shifted to one that was practical, pragmatic, easily understood, withstands quite significant scrutiny and is seen as fair. The, pe the pain is shared all around. And the cautionary note is the drought broke. And the drought broke not with a drizzle, the drought broke, broke with the biggest floods on record as, you know, tends to happen. <laughs> Um, and we found ourselves in a different place. So we find ourselves now where there's community backlash. God, the diesel plant, you don't need it, and it's costing us a fortune. Water prices are high. We found ourselves with new governments, pretty much conservative governments, all are up that eastern seaboard and at the federal level as well. New governments, not accountable for the decisions made, able to re-prosecute a lot of those issues. Water for government is no longer a priority. It's almost a bit of a nuisance because you've still got these programs going that are long term that, oh, geez, you know, it's yesterday's issue. And flood management and flood recovery becomes the new drought. Now, water managers know things will work in cycles. You're in your cycle as we speak. There are two elements to this cycle. The drought enables reform. And you should take that with both hands and run with it. But just be aware that following the drought, there is always the period where a lot of that work is re-prosecuted and there's a period of consolidation and a period of embedding. And that's got to be undertaken. It's less sexy, but it's just as important to make sure the gains that are won during the drought are sustained into the long term. 